So welcome, bienvenidos to today's core coffee chat in observation of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I'm Nicole Lezen, and I'm joined by my co-host, Nicole Young. We are the local consultants who facilitate a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, or CORE. And CORE is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for everyone across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. All our core events are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation, thanks to our interpreter, Stella Lauerman. And we have other team members who help with that who are not here today. And now I'll provide a brief overview of CORE before we hear from our guests today. So CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, which is both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in our county. It has the, these mission and vision statements that have equity at the center and were developed with the input of many of you in, in our community over the last couple of years. When we say equitable health and well-being, we mean that everyone across the lifespan has equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well-being, and that everyone's opportunities and life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or any other social identities. And equity is at the center of this diagram to illustrate that we have to examine and address our individual organizational and systemic beliefs, practices, and structures that may be perpetuating the very inequities that we're determined to eliminate. Since we're meeting today on Domestic Violence Awareness Month and hearing from some of the people working most closely on those issues in our county, just wanna highlight how domestic violence is an example of how these issues are connected to one another. So as you'll hear from our guests, a woman who may feel unsafe at home is worried not just about herself, but her children and an environment that makes it difficult to have a thriving family, for example. Or she may feel unable to leave because of her economic situation or to find safe and affordable housing. She may lack faith in the criminal justice system or the immigration system and its policies. And her children witnessing or experience violence, violence at home may in turn be struggling in school. And all of them may have difficulty seeking or getting the help that they need for physical and emotional health needs through the health system, especially during COVID. So it's just one way that all of these things do relate to each other. So those dotted lines are really important across these different core conditions. Today's event and other core coffee chats and conversations are offered as part of the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. Think of the Core Institute as a container that holds an array of training, TA, and other learning opportunities for people in nonprofits or the public sector, for grassroots groups, um, and really anyone, the business community, anyone who wants to build knowledge, skills, and systems that are needed to fulfill this collective vision of an equitable, thriving, and resilient community. So you're all part of that today, and I know many of you have been in previous chats, and we hope to see you at future ones as well. So thanks for being here, and thanks to our guests today. who are going to walk us through some local trends and responses. First, we're going to hear from Kaylin Foster-Renda, who's the Executive Director of Monarch Services. And then after Kaylin's presentation, we'll hear from Ana Velasquez, who's the Pre Prevention Specialist at Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center. And after we hear from each of them, we'll have time for your questions, but feel free to pose them in the chat as Kaylin and Anna are speaking. And then we'll have time for some discussion. Again, you can pose those questions in English or Spanish. Um, and when we get to that point, if you'd rather raise your hand and speak, that's fine as well. So we will hear from them first, and then we'll all have a discussion together. So thanks everyone for being here and especially to our presenters, Kaylin and Anna. Kaylin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nicole. And I want to thank all of you for being here today to talk about this important subject and to both Nicole's for providing the space for us to share this information with you. Again, my name is Kaylin. I'm the co-executive director at Monarch. I uh, lead with our, my co-leader, Laura Segura, and it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. 
Next slide, please. We want to present, uh, these are our numbers for this past fiscal year, which runs July 1st to June 30th and straddled a large part of COVID. And as you can see here, the number of clients that we served during that time period was 1,500. And we experienced a very large increase in the number of services that were asked to be provided by 75%. And the crisis line calls that we received were up 250%. Uh, the shelter clients that, that sought services were up 150% from years previous, and sadly, we've had five femicides in our county in the past year. Next slide, please. To better understand what this looks like in um, other fiscal years, we have this graph that shows the number of services that are provided um, by Monarch, and that includes all of our services, case management, child and youth, legal services. Um, they, you can see by this bar graph that they increased exponentially. And here, just in this first quarter, we are already seeing, our, our numbers are not declining. They are continuing to rise. And the number of crisis line calls, again, you know, have increased significantly. Next slide, please. So where we've seen the, one of the greatest increases in the, the demand for our shelter services, uh, we, you can see here that the number of services that we've provided, uh, the number of shelter clients that we've served has increased, but the number of bed nights that they are staying with us has increased. So that's the number of, of nights they stay within our shelter program. And there's not a limitation on that. It's basically until we are able to safely house somebody that either in safe and stable housing on their own, or we find shelter elsewhere that better fits their needs, or they're able to find place with friends or family. And we're continuing to see this trend in this first quarter of this year. Next slide, please. The number of youth services has also increased uh, dramatically. We have seen uh, a huge increase in the number of youth that are, are seeking services during this time. Uh, we are seeing a severity of violence against youth increase dramatically. And we expect that trend to continue, especially as there are resources that are now available to our youth through school, community, uh, and service providers being able to open back up after COVID. And we are seeing that. The number of sky interviews we're seeing increase dramatically. Um, and so we are, our child and youth team is very busy responding and we are on location at a number of schools in the county to be able to provide services directly to the youth. So talking about the forms of violence that we're currently seeing, um, we are definitely seeing a significant increase in the number of violent acts within a domestic violence situation and also the intensity of the violence has increased dramatically. So again, we've had five femicides in our county and just to put that into perspective, I have been with Monarch Services for 11 years and prior to last year, there hadn't been five femicides in my tenure at Monarch. So that is significant in one year that that's been five. We're seeing a large increase in the number of strangulations of our clients coming to us, um, which tends to lead to a higher lethality when strangula strangulation happens within relationships. Again, the, the violence has increased dramatically, and we are starting to see more of our clients leave the relationship. Um, we're seeing a higher number of pregnant women uh, through our services, we're seeing a dramatic increase in trauma um, from our youth that are seeking services. And we're seeing increased addiction, both in our youth clients as well as our adult clients. Definitely higher levels of anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation with our clients. Next slide, please. So it's important that we understand some of the root causes and why we are seeing what we're seeing. So one thing I do want to share is that the clients that are currently coming through and have come to our agency over the past year, most of them had domestic violence occurring in the relationships when they came to us. So it wasn't that the onset of COVID sparked new domestic violence in their relationship. It had been happening prior to COVID. It's the increased severity and frequency of the violence that has increased for these families. Um, and the root causes of violence that 
the majority of our clients um, face is historical trauma. So this collective trauma of poverty, racism, that in conjunction with the, the cumulative trauma of adding COVID and all of the trauma that happened around that has definitely increased that severity of abuse and the number of clients that we're seeing. Poverty and other financial stressors are huge indicators of violence within family relationships. Um, and we know that during COVID, uh, it, it is common for a survivor of domestic violence to have a lack of access to resources. That is part of how a, an abusive partner controls them. And during COVID, there was, of course, a, an increased lack of access to resources, being able to reach out to family, being able to see family, having family or friends around to provide you know, respite for folks. It just wasn't there. And childcare and mental health care were, of course, lacking severely. And we're seeing the ramification from that. Isolation from friends and family, um, and of, of course, overcrowded housing conditions. So when we were asked to stay in place, not everyone was safe. And when there is multiple families living within housing situations and you've got financial stressors and the stressors of COVID, of physical health and mental health, it just led to a perfect storm of increased violence within family relationships. Next slide, please. And so one of the things that we always want to do is have our um, community to be in action around this. And the number one thing that is most important as people share is to listen. And when somebody tells you, believe them. Um, never ever blame or shame, never ask them why, never question what is happening in the relationship, listen to them and believe them. Because if there is one instance of a survivor coming forward and they share their story and they're not believed, the chances of them sharing that in the future is very slim. And that creates increased lethality and dangerous situations for families. Um, you can help with safety planning, so providing resources that our community offers, being able to share that, you know, having a packed bag either in your car, having keys readily available, having financial resources readily available. All of these things are very important for uh, people that are experiencing domestic violence. Being able to check in with our loved ones and neighbors um, it, it is imperative. You know, if you hear something, um, if you see something, say something, whether it's to that person or being able to call on community resources to provide that information. Social media has been an amazing tool to be able to use to provide resources and raise awareness, especially when, when folks were not able to get outside resources because they were in their homes um, due to COVID orders, that social media was something that was available. We were so worried at the beginning of COVID that we would not hear from people, that they would not be able to reach out and unbelievably people were able to whether it was through social media or being able to take a walk around the block um, and so those things really matter and sometimes folks just don't know what's available so being able to provide that platform is a really powerful tool and of course we we uh want to have an increased access to mental health services um, within our community, being able to have mental health resources available to community members is absolutely imperative always. And right now, we are still in the middle of COVID. It is absolutely imperative. The, the, the trauma that folks have gone through, the, the increase in mental health issues that we're seeing is, is significant. And something that is very important is, and we see this through our housing program, is that when we can offer housing, financial resources, job training, employment, um, child care resources, transportation resources, the percentage of folks that are able to successfully navigate staying either in a healthy relationship or not being in relationship and being able to self-support themselves is significant. 98% of the folks that have gone through our housing program have been able to stay out of violent relationships. So that is significant. And as a community, that is something that we can offer to our community members, particularly those who have experienced trauma regarding poverty and racism historically through generations. Next slide, please. 
And so we, at, you know, at Monarch and I know Walnut Avenue have been our partners all alongside and uh, other community-based organizations. We, there is so much that is happening in the world, particularly over the past year and a half, that sometimes the local voice of what's happening can get lost. And so all of us have uh, a job to do around that. And at Monarch, we've been um, being, we've been having these community conversations. Um, we held a vigil. It's important to honor the lives that have been lost um, over the past year and a half. There are friends and family that are left behind and community. It impacts all of us when one person experiences violence and when somebody is killed due to domestic violence, it absolutely impacts every person in our community. Uh, we've been able to um, provide city council presentations to raise awareness about what is happening in our community and of course this wonderful platform of CORE um, and the the South County response group that has been so integral in being able to respond to COVID and creating equity um, around vaccine and resources for COVID has now been responding to the increased in violence and community-based organizations are coming together with Watsonville P Police Department to be able to offer wraparound services to folks that are experiencing violence and also in the school and communities. The school community is absolutely a, a community that we need to be very entrenched and very involved and be able to offer our support. That community of youth is, is going through significant mental health and we've seen it um, you know, firsthand in our community, the, the level of violence that folks are experiencing. So thank you so much, and we'll be happy to answer questions, and I, Anna is now going to take the floor. Yes, thank you, Kaylin, and, and Anna, thank you for joining us. And as I mentioned at the, at the outset, if anybody had joined late, Anna is the Prevention Specialist at Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center, and please keep your questions and comments coming in the chat, and after Anna's presentation, we'll have a chance to discuss them together. So Anna, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I am here to talk about domestic violence and the impact that our organization has seen on children and other family members who might be living in the same household. Uh, next slide. And here are some trends that we have seen in um, our services during, you know, this last fiscal year. So overall, we have seen a 15% increase in calls in comparison to prior years. One of the really important things to note is that a significant number of those increased calls are actually coming from male survivors coming to, uh, out to get support, uh, folks that are non-binary and trans-identifying folks that are also feeling that their domestic violence situation has gotten to the point where they need to reach out to somebody for help. Uh, this is something that um, we had not seen uh, before. We did get a small percentage of uh, folks from those communities reaching out to us, but not in the same level as we've seen over the past year. Uh, there are 22% of calls that we have received either on our hotline and also um, inquiries coming for uh, when folks show up at our agency have been around emergency accommodation where people are getting to the point where they feel so unsafe in their, in their home that they are just grabbing whatever they can and either you know on the road calling our crisis hotline or they're just showing up at our agency and seeking um, shelter. One of the other things that we have seen is that in prior years, it there was a, a pretty diverse uh, group of folks, you know, folks that had children, um, individuals that were experiencing domestic violence that um, were seeking shelter. But over the past year, we have observed that a significant number of people that are actually reaching out to us um, for uh, emergency accommodation have been parents with their children that are seeking safety. In, a, in regards to our legal advocacy um, service, 19% of our participants were actually seeking 
restraining order information or were um, attempting to actively work with us in order to get a restraining order. Again, because the domestic violence that they're experiencing at home has increased in both frequency and severity as um, Kaylin mentioned. So now, how does domestic violence impact child, children and other family members? So over the past year, and this is something that's also applicable to years prior that had been happening, domestic violence stress can negatively impact a parent's relationship with their children or with their other family members if they're living in a multi-generational household, which, you know, again, due to uh, housing costs in Santa Cruz, that's a very common occurrence. In a couple of ways. So first of all, when somebody is dealing with domestic violence stress, their primary focus is survival, which puts them in a very difficult position to have a very hard time coping with everyday parenting challenges. On top of that, they are also being put in a situation where Maybe it's not themselves in their parenting practices from the survivor that is impacting the parent-child relationship. It might be the behavior of the person that's causing harm that's impacting the relationship where they are demeaning the parent in front of the child, undermining the parental, their parental authority. They are also uh, essentially conducting character assassination for um, especially around extended family members. And one of the other things to, to keep in mind is that when folks are so stuck in survival mode, they're not going to be able to cope with the circumstances in safe and healthy ways. And so this puts uh, people at risk of severe mental health outcomes, of engaging in unsafe coping, which can then detrimentally uh, impact their children and can also negatively affect their relationships and the perceptions that their extended family members can have on them as survivors. The person that's causing harm not only can solely direct their um, harmful behavior towards the survivor, but they can, they can also redirect that behavior towards their children and other family members living in the home. So there is a very strong correlation that indicates that if somebody is engaging in abusive behavior towards their partner, there's a very high probability that they're also engaging in harmful behavior towards their children, or they might engage in their, uh, that harmful behavior towards other family members living in the home. Uh, particularly if the survivor and these extended family members are solely reliant on the person that's causing harm for their housing needs, that can give that person an incredible amount of power, particularly here in Santa Cruz County, where the lack of affordable housing and the high cost of rent can put people in situations where they just have to play nice with somebody that is engaging in unsafe behavior towards them or towards others in the household. And finally, a lot of participants report that um, this be violent behavior that they're experiencing at the hands of their partner, or sometimes it might not necessarily be their partner. It could be another family member, um, parent, sibling, etc. that some, they feel that they, it gets to the point where this type of behavior is normalized as a tool of conflict resolution and of getting needs met for those living in the household. And usually for a lot of parents who have children, they come to this realization when they start seeing their children replicating the harmful behavior that they're observing at the hands of another parent or another adult in the household, in order to get their needs met or in um, pretend play. That's usually another form of, of behaviors from children where this, um, this normalization is starting to become crystallized and more evident to survivor parents. Next slide. So 
after hearing all of that, right, there's a lot of next steps that we can take both on an individual level and also on a community level. A lot of these um, action steps on domestic violence prevention are actually based on findings from the Center for Disease Control that we find um, that have very strong um, evidence and backing um, in producing positive domestic violence prevention outcomes. So first of all, sc school-age children can be taught skills to foster healthy relationships. Either these can be taught by parents, right? If the parents themselves receive some sort of education around healthy relationships, or they can be taught this in schools or youth serving organizations, or they can come to us at Walnut Avenue. We always love to talk to young people about healthy relationships. And we also love to talk to parents or guardians about how to have those conversations. Um, unlike the sex, sex ed talks, right, that a lot of parents are expected to engage in, a lot of parents sometimes don't have the right language or tools in order to engage in um, those healthy relationship conversations with their children, and we are more than happy to provide support around that. All adult, and all this goes for all adults, right? Uh, even adults outside the family who might be um, in positions to support youth. All adults that interact with youth need to learn skills on how to be effective youth allies in instances of domestic violence, right? You need a certain kind of language. You need to ask the right questions, right? In order to deter make the right call on whether there is domestic violence happening, right? Some, some people, whether they're parents or even young people, are not going to be up front and say, hey, domestic violence is happening at home, right? Unless things are very, very bad and they trust you, but if there's no trust, right, and you're only making initial contact, you need to develop the skills in order to ask, hey, do you feel safe at home? Or do you feel unsafe at home? You know, what are some of the things that you can, uh, what are, in what ways can I support you? What resources do you feel that you need at this time? Sometimes asking um, those critical questions can get to the heart of maybe something more serious is happening in the home, but that but maybe this person, whether they're a parent or a child, might not feel comfortable enough to say upfront to you, again, unless there's a pre-existing um, rapport and trust in your working relationship with them. Again, and this is, now going a little bit bigger, so schools and other service providers can help parents uh, or other members of a family access support and resources for themselves, their children, or other family members. Sometimes uh, service providers, we are getting calls from maybe not necessarily the primary individuals involved in the domestic violence situation, but it could be uh, a relative that's living in the home and is seeing this happening and is also being impacted and they need support. Um, so please make sure to connect them with either um, Walnut Avenue or Monarch uh, in order to get that support that they need. Um, and also a lot of um, schools and let's say medical professionals are usually the first folks out in the field that are able to identify when families are experiencing domestic violence. So it is even more critical um, for any school official or staff or medical professional to make those resource referrals, especially if there's already uh, trust in your working relationship with a, a young person or their family. Next slide. And again, another gentle reminder that for all service providers to work closely with um, agencies like um, Walnut Avenue or Monarch um, that specialize in domestic violence in order to make referrals and handoffs go smoothly. Sometimes, you know, especially for new staff that joins a lot of these organizations, it could be helpful as part of their training to reach out to domestic violence organizations just to get introduce themselves. Hey, I'm from so-and-so agency. I would like to just hear a little bit more about what the work that you do. So that way I'm able to more confidently talk about your services with the participants that I'm working with. Um, in addition to that, you can always, at least for Walnut Avenue, uh, you if you're a service provider, 
and you are dealing with a situation where you're coming across uh, a participant of yours that could potentially be experiencing domestic violence or is um, showcasing trauma symptoms that indicate that they're experiencing domestic violence, you can always give us a call. We would be more than happy to consult with you and to help you um, navigate you know, the, any follow conversations that you would like to have with this person um, and in order to ensure that they're receiving wraparound care and support. And on, and again, now looking to the bigger picture, we as a community must support quality early education initiatives for young children. Again, if young children are being exposed to harmful behavior and that's all that they see as normal, that's a problem, not just for that individual child, but us as a wider community. So it is incredibly important that we support uh, young kids to re um, receive early education where they're able to learn pro-social skills and they're able to connect with safe adults outside of that home and that family system. So they're able to witness for themselves, what is it like to solve conflicts? What is it like to get needs met in a safe and healthy way, right? And finally, um, as Kaylin also mentioned, um, affordable housing. We as a community need to really step up and do a better job at supporting any affordable housing initiatives. Um, it, it is the, by far the number one barrier for a lot of domestic violence survivors that we at Walnut Avenue hear about, where either they are fearful of becoming homeless with their children because of the exorbitant prices around housing here in this county, or they have become homeless as a result of fleeing domestic violence and not finding any place to rent, right? And one of the and one of the reasons why it's so important is that once people are housed, right, when they are in a stable environment, they're finally able to focus on their healing and are in a much better position to engage in safer behaviors, not just for themselves, but if their parents and, fam and their members of a bigger family, they're also able to ex um, engage in safer behaviors with their family members, with other members in the community, and also foster more healthy and thriving relationships between themselves, their children, and then everybody else in the community. Next. And so what are some of the, our efforts that we have done in order to get the word out? So um, back in late July, early August, we conducted a podcast interview around gender-based violence. Uh, and prevention for teens and young adults. I highly encourage you to check it out. It's it's through the State of Mind uh, podcast and radio show on KSQD, one of our local stations. Um, they, it also features uh, in some amazing um, comments from uh, teen dating violence survivor that you know I encourage any service provider or parent that engages with youth in any way to check it out um, and get some of that wisdom. We also, um, this over this past year, we launched our Teen Dating Violence Virtual Art Show, uh, where we go into the classrooms either during Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month, or we're also doing it this month um, in honor of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, um, to provide healthy relationships workshops um, to their classes. And then based on the presentation, students then are able to create e any piece of art, whether it's graphic art, uh, traditional art, creative writing, um, videos, anything, as long as it allows them to get creative. And they are able to be featured in our virtual art show. Um, you know, you can find the virtual art show page on our website. It's really amazing to hear some of the uh, takes that young people have in our community around healthy relationships, boundaries, and um, relationship violence. That's great, Anna. I'm, I'm going to leave this slide up so people can see 
um, more of, of this. Uh, I want to leave some time for questions as well. And Nicole Young just put a link to the um, KSQD um, presentation yeah. to the and then chat finally, so people can find it. Yeah. Yeah. And then finally, uh, we just launched a parenting support program. Uh, again, over the past year, we recognized that a lot of survivor parents are in dire need of receiving some one on one parenting support, particularly if they um, don't have many other people who they can um, consult with around parenting within the context of domestic violence due to isolation. Uh, we are, a, they are able to receive support around this um, and we are able to um, coach them through positive parenting techniques and for a lot of our families of color, particularly Latino families, we are able to approach positive parenting from a decolonialized perspective in order to um, take into account um, some of the historical trauma that might um, inform the some oppressive parenting techniques that they might be using without even realizing the detrimental impact that it has on their children and the relationship between themselves and their kids. Thank you, Anna. That sounds amazing. Um, we do have some questions that people submitted as part of their registration process. So I wanted to give everyone a chance to ask those questions of each other and of Anna and Kaylin while we're all together. And thank you both for sharing so much information and also for everything that you do um, year round, not just during Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Huge asset to our community, um, even though the demand for services has clearly increased and outpaced a lot of what's available, you're doing your best to keep up. And I think one of the questions is how people can help. So are you accepting Donations for things like clothes or toiletries or what what would be what would be particularly helpful if people can make donations to either of your organizations? So we have just uh, started accepting donations for both clothing and toiletry items uh, for our shelter clients, and our offices are open um, with limited staff every day now. Okay, and for Walnut Avenue. Um, what we need to be donated really um, changes depending on the week. So I would just encourage folks to call our main office line in order to inquire as to what are the current needs um, because sometimes it might be toiletries, sometimes it might be a uh, feminine product. So, you know, it varies widely. So I would just encourage folks, you know, if you're feeling like donating, just call our office and check uh, into what is the most pressing need at, at the current time. Okay, thank you. And we have a, a couple related questions. So one is, um, and I think you both touched on this, what, what are, what's a question or a piece of information that can be used to screen for domestic violence? I'm not sure from the question which, which type of setting that would be in, but I'm sure you have some ideas to share. And are there predictive indications of violence or particularly murder and femicide of women? This questioner knew that it's most dangerous when a woman tries to leave, but that's not the only time. So what, what are the things that are, are really um, important to pay attention to as red flags for, in your mind? So I, as far as the question to ask, I mean, it really is going to depend on the setting that you're in. So if it is a safe setting that you feel like it's always best to ask directly. Um, one of the things that's important to understand around domestic violence is that it becomes normalized within relationships. And so a lot of times a survivor does not understand um, that they are even they're in a domestic violence relationship and or the significant um, harm that could come from it. So being able to ask directly, um, you know, do you feel safe in your relationship, both emotionally and physically is always really important to ask because I think it's really important for folks to understand it isn't always physical violence and it tends to start with financial abuse and or emotional abuse. Um, and if it's, if it's not a situation that you can ask directly, you know, saying things like, like, how are your relation, how is your relationship going with your partner? Do you feel safe in your relationship? Um, have you noticed an increase in conflict within your relationship? So sometimes the more indirect way um, can work, but it, it's really important um, when you can be direct to be able to be direct and to, you um, allow for space for folks to be able to report. Thank you, Kaylin. Anna, anything to add? 
Yeah, um, sometimes one of the questions that I encourage people, especially if it's, you know, um, where rapport has already been built and you have a little bit more of a, an easier time asking, you know, slightly more direct questions, you know, one of the one of the questions I oftentimes encourage folks to ask is, um, do you feel like you can say no in your relationship without experiencing, you know, negative, severe negative ramifications or consequences? And that in and of itself can be, can tell you so much, right? If a person speaks up, it's like, yeah, like, I feel like I can say no with no, um, no fear of punishment or reprimand, you know, then their relationship might be just un they're slightly unhealthy, but not abusive. But then if somebody is expressing fear of, no, I need to, I need to do everything that they tell me to do, or I need to agree with them all the time because, you know, it's for the best that is coming from a place of fear, right? And it's probably because when they have said no or disagreed, they have experienced either emotional abuse or physical abuse as a result. Okay, thank you so much. And, and Jasmine, I, I see in the chat that you've mentioned um, Laura Segura's episode on healthcare untold with a link as well as the new uh, Justice and Gender Commission um, with both Monarch and Walnut Avenue and others on this call, um, starting a month of a month of healing campaign to ask for stories of people. Um, so I, I wanted to give you a chance to say a word about that if you'd like. Hi, folks. Good to see everyone. Sorry, I can't jump on the video right now. Um, but yeah, part of the Commission on Justice and Gender, which was uh, formed after our task force that worked um, over the last couple of years we decided that we really wanted to share stories of healing um, because our community has been through so much trauma, cumulative trauma with everything that's been going on. And I think that we all hear and understand, um, you know, the, the effects of it, but we don't really hear um, uplifting of survivors and really creating space for stories of healing. And we really want to do that. And um, also there's a campaign hashtag for um, domestic violence uh, healing month and it's uh, everyone knows someone and I think it's really poignant because um, whether we individually have experienced domestic violence whether as uh, survivors or in the household um, or we have friends we know people that have everyone knows someone so this is really our job as a community to stand up, break down the barriers around the stigma and communicate around this and not make survivors feel like they are the problem. Um, we need to provide that space and support for our folks to heal. And um, what better than for us to step out and talk about our own stories of survival and healing. And I am a survivor of domestic violence. And I will be sharing my own personal story. And I really urge those of you that are in those professional positions to really step out of that darkness and really share your story as well. Because that's what really uh, leads the way for others to feel safe and comfortable if they see folks that um, out there in the community that have similar struggles. So I invite you to reach out to us. Uh, I put my email in the chat. If you want to direct people to email me, if they want to talk about the stories, we can video record, we can uh, audio record, and people can also share their written stories. And our goal is to get these into uh, local media and social, uh, social media outlets um, at the end of each week as um, the DV numbers get posted daily um, via the D DA's office. We're trying to collaborate with those news networks to also share at least one healing story at the end of the week so that we can balance that out and provide a little bit of context as well to those numbers. So thank you, Nicole, for letting me say something. You're welcome, Jasmine. Thanks for sharing all of that. And um, Sophia's mentioning in the chat that she's one of the success stories from Monarch. Um, that's great. Thank you. And looks like um, that, that would be one contact from today for you, Jasmine. So really encourage people to, um, to tell their stories if they feel comfortable to doing that. Um, Anna, you mentioned in your presentation some of the statistics about, uh, about men reaching out for help. And one of the questions we got through the registration process was to talk about that. So I wondered if either of you would like to address that issue as well. Yeah, so male survivors, um, you know, historically have 
had a lot of reluctance re reaching out to domestic violence services. Um, typically, it's due to um, the perception that because domestic violence has, you know, historically been an issue primarily affecting women, that our services would not be, um, you know, accessible to them. Um, however, again, over the past year, um, it has given us a little bit more of a glimmer of hope at Walnut Avenue, the fact that more male survivors are feeling um, compelled to reach out to us and get the support that they need because I'm, it isn't easy for male survivors. They are having to unpack a lot of the stigma around what it means to be a, sur a survivor who, who is male, right? And uh, unpack the ideas of toxic masculinity telling them that they should have, you know, done, they should have stood up for themselves, they should have fought back, right? Because they're supposed to be tough and strong all the time. When that is such an incredibly damaging belief for somebody that has experienced harm. And just because somebody identifies as male does not mean that the level of harm that they can experience in a relationship is somehow less than and the harm that somebody who identifies as female experiences in their relationship. Thank you, Anna. Kaylin, did you have anything to add? Sure. I mean, I think I, I, I copy everything that Anna has reported. And, you know, statistically, it's one in nine men report um, experiencing domestic violence. And we know that domestic violence is one of the most underreported, um, you know, crimes that exists. So we know that the numbers are significantly higher and there is huge stigma for males to come forward and to understand that the service delivery is for everyone. Thank you. Are there other questions that you'd like to raise? I know, I know there was a question around lethality. Um, yes. I think it's important for us to understand being that we're living in the times that we're living and the increase in lethality and domestic violence and the femicides. Um, and something that is really important to understand is when there is a weapon in a home um, and domestic violence is in a home, that woman is 20 times more likely to die. Uh, due to a weapon in domestic violence. And again, I, I had talked about this previously when, when asking or screening somebody if they're experiencing domestic violence, being able to provide a resource to them to be able to go to Walnut or to go to Monarch is so important because one of the first things we do is that danger assessment tool. Nine times out of 10, the person that is walking through our doors does not understand the severity of the violence that they're experiencing. And once they can see that in black and white, once that, that assessment is complete, they are more uh, readily to be in action around either seeking shelter or understanding that they need to get support around domestic violence. And so that's something that's really important. And if you have friends or family members that you are seeing an increase in severity or or increase in frequency of domestic violence, that's another huge indicator um, that, that a femicide could be likely. Um, and, and we all know that leaving, you know, when a person leaves the relationship and a restraining order is put in place, that is the most dangerous time for somebody in a domestic violence relationship. So making sure that they have the resources and support um, during that time is absolutely critical. And Kaylin, you mentioned um, the increase in strangulations and, and choking kinds of data. And I, I think that's another piece that you that you are tracking as a escalation and danger sign. We are, and we, we are definitely seeing a large increase in this. And I think part of it is, um, it is the severity of violence is absolutely increasing. We have seen that over the past 18 months. And they, this, the folks that are responding to domestic violence calls have more knowledge around strangulation. Santa Clara County has done a pilot program for the past two years around strangulation that is coupled with their sexual assault response team program. And I think bringing that awareness to Santa Cruz County has been really um, pivotal in being able to understand the, the severity and the treatment that is needed um, when somebody is experiencing strangulation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. 
And then you both touched on the, the importance of housing um, in terms of someone trying to get out of a violent situation, but then there's also violence that people experience when they're less protected living, um, you know, in, as you mentioned the overcrowded conditions, but also living rough or, you know, living uh, or being unsheltered is, is just an increased risk of a different kind from the situation someone may have left. So or is anyone tracking any of that? Um, do you have anything to share in that specifically about people who are unhoused or? So one of the things that we housed? have new is doing is we are working closely with organizations like the Harm Reduction Coalition who are go who go out um, to some of our homeless encamp encampments here locally in order to provide safety planning information um, for folks experiencing homelessness. Um, that is usually the one of the methods that we have found that is the best way to provide, um, build trust, right? For a lot of people experiencing homelessness um, who might have experienced a lot of negative stigma, right? In trying to um, access services due to their um, experiencing homelessness, um, they might be incredibly reluctant to seek services, even in um, a severe domestic violence situation. And so, for us, it's incredibly important to start building trust with that community, to start getting the word out that we are um, a place that is um, of trust for them uh, and also any allies, right? Any um, fellow individuals that might be experiencing homelessness as well, who you know might have heard of us during one of our, you know, um, one of the days when we go out to engage with, um, with them at their camps. Um, to let their friend know who's experiencing domestic violence, hey, you know, there's this organization, they're, they're friendly to people like us. Like, I, th I, th I think it's really important for you to go there, right? That type of referral, especially for somebody who is experiencing domestic violence and is experiencing homelessness, is going to bear more weight than if they were to receive it from a law enforcement officer in a very, you know, impersonal clinical way. Thank you. And before we close out, we have another um, question from, from Susan asking about the um, positive solutions work at Monarch to mention that. And then um, a question about terminology of domestic violence and intimate partner violence. And while that's happening, I'm gonna put up a slide showing some upcoming core coffee chats just so that we can stay on track with our timing here. So right. Kaylin, I'll turn it over to you and, and thank you both so much for this. Great, thank you so much. So our positive solutions program is centered on the person who's done harm. It is a program that we have um, a cohort of participants that are able to go through an in-depth curriculum around um, social emotional well-being, communication skills, conflict resolution skills. And the reason that we started participating in serving the person who's done harm is because we have heard our clients uh, very loud and clear for years now that one, they don't want to relieve, leave their relationship. Um, they want help to be able to find healing within their relationship. The services that are available to persons who do harm are very limited. Um, and so being able to provide that resource. And what we also know is the, the dynamic in domestic violence is extremely complicated. And the person who does harm has experienced the majority of the time childhood trauma, similar to what we see on the survivor side. And so being able to provide those resources uh, is part of our mission of lives free from violence and abuse. Even if the family doesn't stay together, um, that person who's done harm will move on to another relationship. And if they don't have the skills to be able to be in a safe and healthy and respectful relationship, then the, the cycle will perpetuate itself and children get involved and perpetuate those cycles. So we have been running cohorts and they've been very successful and we're really excited to be able to provide these services to our community. Thanks, Kaylin. And just in the minute or so that we have left, um, we also just wanted to let you know about these upcoming events. We have a feedback survey going on. And then there's also this question about the terminology between domestic violence and intimate partner violence or IPV for people who might not be familiar with the 
the term that's sometimes used in public health and other circles, trying to be direct and balancing that with things that you might have a partner, but you're not living with them. So do you all have thoughts about that? Do you switch back and forth? Do you have a preference? I, I, I'll go first. So sure. at least for myself and Walnut Avenue, we prefer domestic violence because domestic because intimate partner violence isn't the only form of violence that can happen in relationships. There's also things like parent to child abuse, child to parent violence, you know, if an adolescent child is engaging in harmful behavior towards a parent, elder abuse, and also sibling abuse, which is violence that is um, happening between two related children. And so domestic violence, it's for us, it's a better fitting umbrella term to encapsulate all of those different um, family violence and relationship violence dynamics that we oftentimes have to work with um, in the field. Got it. Okay. So that, so a broader domestic, not meaning under a roof, but just broader related to home. Um, Kaylin? We, we use both terms and it's really dependent on the situation. Um, we know that uh, people understand domestic violence and it is something that historically that's the term that has been used. And so um, we find that it, it really depends on who we're working with and the audience that we're working with. And so we use them pretty interchangeably. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Kaylin and Anna, for helping us observe domestic violence slash intimate partner violence awareness month. And you've made us all more aware and given us some really helpful tools and things to think about, which we appreciate so much. Thanks to all of you for being here, for hanging out for an extra minute. Um, please join us for um, a, a talk next week about the upcoming vaccines for five to 11 year olds. You'll have a chance to ask questions from both um, County Office of Education staff and a local uh, pediatrician community, as well as um, PDPSA and things that are happening in all of those realms. So we look forward to sharing that with you. There's on the 19th of this month, there will be a session um, highlighting the guaranteed income pilot um, at Community Ventures. Um, reimagining the safety net. So that's a really exciting local development that we all can learn about. The Unite Us platform update is up after that um, for closing the loop on different kinds of referrals. And then we'll have a series of training and technical assistance events related to the core RFP, which should be released in November. And so we will keep you posted on all of that. And I think we're officially out of time, but thank you everyone and especially our guests for taking time out of their schedules to join us and to all of you for participating. We'll hang out for a minute or two if there are additional questions and that's it. Thank you, gracias. And thanks to Stella for interpreting heroically. I try to slow down, but I know I don't. <laughs>